<coughs> okay, hi everyone. I'm glad to see that uh, a lot of turnaround turn up, although it's not the usual time for the seminars. Uh, I just say it up here, just remember there's another seminar this week. Uh, so Alessandro was supposed to be on last week, Thursday. And I'm always can't. late. <laughs> yeah. We cancelled it because of the, uh, uh, the protest, interference day, but we have another one on Thursday. Yes, so just remember that. Okay, I'm very happy that we have uh, Alessandro Trevi here with us. So Alessandro, uh, Alessandro originally from Florence, and, uh, is, as much as I've heard, is a kind of avid uh, Florentian, who's uh, 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 an expert, at least from my view, expert in, in Dante's uh, writing, uh, being the Florentian. He did his PhD here at the Hebrew University with Daniel Amit, and uh, and, and now he's, he's a full professor of neuroscience from CSA in, in Trieste in Italy. He also has been a long time visitor at the Norwegian University for Science and Technology. And between 2011 and 2013, he was the uh, uh, consul for scientific affairs at the Italian embassy in Tel Aviv. So he did, uh, besides his scientific work, and from his scientific work, he's interested in the neural basis of cognition. And today, we hear, or may not hear about the hippocampus, I'm not sure anymore. But so uh, tangential. Tangential. So 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 I won't say what we're here today, I'm mean, just give it to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. But I, I would have I'm very happy to be here. That's my the place where I did my PhD, so it's great to come back. And uh, I thought that uh, in in these uh, in these months what uh, coming back to Jerusalem I should talk about something like uh, sharing memories uh, in uh, mixed populations, but I don't want to kindle a fire, even though it's like Baumer, so it should be appropriate for today. So we'll, you'll, you'll have to make do with an ordinary neuroscience talk, that's the, the only slide that is not uh, uh, neuroscience. So I want to, to uh, touch tangentially on uh, the work of uh, three students. The first one, uh, very brief, uh, David Spalla, and then Francesca, and then uh, spend a bit, a bit more time at the end on uh, the work of uh, uh, Quang Gil, my student from the DPRK, the North Korea. And uh, it's three uh, very different pieces of work, so I, I think the the task for today is to find the connections. So, uh, Davide, he was given the opportunity by uh, Charlotte Porcara, who is a good friend and a distant uh, relative, maybe, of mine, to look at the data she had recorded in the Moser lab uh, many years ago and was still uh, incompletely analyzed where the interesting finding is that uh, in the regions next to the hippocampus, the medial and terrenal cortex, but also the, the two regions that are uh, um, close to what is called the subiculum, the parasubiculum and the presubiculum, the names are confusing, but it's, it's little uh, bits of brain close to the hippocampus. There are <coughs> uh, cells that uh, uh, code for the angular head velocity. These are these a AHV cells. There are uh, cells that have been uh, uh, discovered before that code for the linear speed of the animal. But uh, uh, the relatively uh, new findings uh, is that uh, there are in, in all these three regions, so this should be um, Medial and terrenal cortex, uh, parasubiculum and presbyculum, there is a, a, a proportion of, uh, it's quantified here, of about 17%, same proportion in the three regions of the cell to the cortex that are sensitive to the angular head velocity. Some of them are uh, monotonically dependent on, uh, on uh, the absolute head velocity. Uh, uh, velocity, which being the angular velocity can go from negative to positive values, so it's a kind of uh, it's a, not an uh, immediately intuitive form of coding. And some are uh, is, um, is that uh, 
uh, sensitive to the to the absolute value. This this is would be the, the what we, we normally think of as a cell that uh, that codes for the absolute value of the angular velocity either in one direction or in the other direction. So there, these are three examples from the region, and these are examples instead of this less intuitive form of coding, which is uh, kind of monotonical, so it goes from kind of a uh, very low rate when the uh, head velocity is very uh, negative to high rate when it's uh, uh, positive in the other direction. So there are these cells, but uh, the interesting thing is that they are uh, together like mixed together with uh, the cells that have been uh, characterized uh, this slide before that are sensitive to linear velocity that are also present in all three regions in about uh, uh, similar, very similar proportions. And then they are also there together with the standard head direction and grid cells. So these are cells that are not uh, uh, coding apparently for the time derivative, but for the the, uh, the real thing, the head direction, the whose time derivative is the, is the angular velocity of the head direction, and for the the grid cells are coding for position, whose uh, one type of derivative is the linear speed. So also this type of cells are present in these three regions also in very similar proportion. And uh, the main result of this paper is that actually these uh, different populations of cells are not different. They are all mixed. It's impossible to characterize individual cells as being uh, sensitive to, you can say, how sensitive they are to angular head direction, how sensitive they are to head direction uh, uh, sorry, yeah. to velocity of the, of the head direction or to head direction per se, how much they express a grid pattern and uh, how much they are sensitive to linear speed. So here, I tell you the, 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 the three uh, kind of three-dimensional scatter plots uh, contrast these indicators of the grid score for gridness, head direction score, and here is for the unidirectional under a head uh, the velocity, and this is for the p direction, and this is for the speed. And what you see is that uh, there are these lumps of, uh, of cells that do not uh, uh, cluster in any way so that you can define a class of cell. You can put an arbitrary threshold the way you did it and say everything that is above the threshold uh, for this two indicator is green, and I think that is above the threshold. If the one indicator is blue, and that's completely arbitrary, but there is no indication of, of clustering of B modality, B modality. So, cell classes, to make it short, uh, do not exist in these three regions, but there are very uh, clearly these uh, correlates that are present, that are part of what, uh, of what uh, uh, the region probably does. So, the kind of upshot of these people looking at these recordings is that uh, if there was uh, an engineer or a, maybe an architect, a Norman Foster, designing coding in the, uh, the pre-parasubiculum and middle entire cortex, either did a very sloppy job or maybe a very sophisticated job that, uh, that we don't uh, understand. So there seems to be a lot of, uh, of disorder in this region. A more, uh, uh, maybe a restricted, but very interesting type of uh, disorder is the one that comes from this uh, beautiful paper by Nakam Lanowski, the right one, with the uh, first daughter, uh, Tamir Eliab, in which they you probably all know this, uh, this uh, experiment, they recorded from uh, from uh, bats uh, flying in a, in a long tunnel. And the primary result is that uh, uh, cells in, in, uh, in the CO1 region of the hippocampus have 
multiple fields, something that you can observe also in a less dramatic setting, but here it's, uh, it's uh, very clear and, uh, and prominent. They have multiple fields. Here the, the different fields, they, they are plotted in, in, in the two directions in which the darts fly, blue in one and, and red in the other. And what you can see also moving from the distance to this uh, slide is this, the different fields, like if you take this example, this cell that has these uh, three fields in this direction, they come with very different widths and uh, different also uh, peak rates. You can see that by the, the histograms here. So look at this cell. There is a multitude of, of the fields, uh, clearly. Uh, concentrations around certain positions, but they come with different uh, peak rates and different widths. So, seemingly another case of, uh, of really lawless disorder, something very different from our uh, uh, basic intuition about uh, place cells that was uh, constructed through uh, uh, years of, uh, of experimental investigations by many different labs and that maybe we have, we have tried to make sense of all this data that was coming from many different labs by constructing a, a model that is uh, too ordered and too simple and is, is uh, at odds with what, uh, what uh, Tamir sees in his bats. There is, uh, however, something that is uh, a bit of a, of a law not completely lawless, and that is in these distributions, like here, they, they collected the statistics of the number of fields per cell in each direction, and you can see that the statistic is very beautiful, it's a kind of a, a, a um, you, you, you should notice the, the log scale here, so this is a beautiful exponential distribution in the number of fields very close to a straight line when, when the scale is long. And here it's uh, the distribution of field sizes and uh, this is, uh, is very close to a log normal distribution. So uh, this statistically there is some, some kind of, uh, of law or maybe it's the law of disorder we don't know but that inspired us to to try to understand whether this uh, very disordered representation could be the basis for what we think, many people think, we are not very original in this, that is the primary contribution of the hippocampus, that is to use this uh, special code that the hippocampus receives already uh, elaborated, prepared by, from other cortical regions, and construct with them uh, memories which include uh, also other content beyond the uh, space. So, in particular, uh, we think of the CA3 region as a, uh, a network that can, uh, can uh, learn in one shot a conjunction of uh, uh, different types of content and then uh, establish uh, memories that are also spatial. Can it do it when the, the spatial information comes in this very disorderly way? So this was uh, work that was uh, 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 undertaken by Francesca uh, in, uh, in my group with uh, also contributions uh, by Remy Monasson in Paris. And there is uh, there are many caveats of course to this uh, modeling study, but uh, two main targets uh, are the fact that the experimental data is uh, from CA1, uh, not from CA3. There is uh, new data hopefully coming soon from CA3, which is, uh, which is similar and different, and we'll hear about that soon from, uh, from uh, the Ulanowski lab. But there, there is the other caveat which in a sense partially uh, cancels the, the first one, and that is that uh, when we record from, uh, from uh, animals uh, moving in space, we, uh, we don't know to what extent the activity that we see 
is the activity that uh, the system tries to store in memory or is the activity that it retrieves from memory, the two things are intrinsically mixed. The fact that uh, the data is from C1 uh, kind of alleviates a bit this problem because uh, C1 being uh, essentially a feed-forward network, uh, we hope there is less difference between this uh, stored and retrieved activity. So, uh, the modeling is built on these uh, shaky legs, but uh, hopefully the, the two uh, main caveats partially cancel each other. So, what Francesca did was to start from the <coughs> very simple uh, neural network model of uh, CFP, in which she, she took uh, as a, uh, one key ingredient statistical distribution like those observed, she reproduced, which is very easy, in, uh, in the mathematical model, and then added simply special linear units, the kind of simplified uh, uh, units that allow for, uh, for simple <coughs> analytical treatment, and uh, synaptic weights, a model that's having encoded this uh, data, what we call it, is a uh, uh, patterns and activity that uh, reflect uh, the, the position of the bath in the tunnel and encoded with a simple so-called Hebbian uh, learning rule. So it's a very standard uh, auto-associative uh, network model. And then what uh, you, are, uh, you are expected to, to get from it is that... Uh, what is that? What is? Eta, yes. Eta would be uh, the, the activity of uh, neuron I in position S along the tunnel, where the neuron I would be assigned with a random number generator, a certain number of fields, each of which has a, a width taken from the distribution of width and a peak rate taken from the distribution of width. So we, we kind of randomly assign widths to all these cells. Then uh, each cell in general, we, we look at the model when each cell has one field, but in general when each cell has several fields. And then these are two cells. And we have this happy rule where there is this important fact that we subtract the, the mean. Yeah. So <coughs> what you, you, you would expect in this type of uh, models for, uh, for uh, uh, spatial memories is that uh, uh, the, model, uh, the, net, the model network establishes some kind of uh, uh, a, a, a approximation to a continuous attractor. A continuous attractor would be an attracting manifold in the multidimensional space of the activity of all the, of all the units in the network where uh, the manifold reflects the geometry of the space that, uh, in which the, the animal moves. In this case, the space is essentially unidimensional. So we would expect that uh, in the multi-activity space of all these cells, there could be, say, 2,000 cells in the model, something like that, 10,000, there is a, a unidimensional manifold which is attractive for the activity in all the other points of this space. And then along this manifold, ideally, it should be continuous. So each position of the manifold should be marginally stable. But in practice, there are uh, even small uh, effects of disorder of noise that would break the exact continuity. But it would be what is, uh, <coughs> what is called maybe not a continuous uh, attractor network. But uh, Francesca liked to call it a, a continuous quasi attractor. So there would be still a manifold in this uh, uh, high dimensional space, a unidimensional manifold, in which uh, uh, um, uh, activity, in, to which activity is attracted, and then it would not be able to stabilize at every position because there would be small disomogeneity. In homogeneities, but it would, be, it would find a, a position which is near the 
the position which ideally uh, they, the, the, the animal is uh, uh, is taking the thing. So this attractor would be <coughs> would be uh, uh, the asymptotic state of the network when it's left without input. So it would be a memory network in the sense that if you if you start it with partial input with this attraction it should go to an asymptotic state that reflects the retrieval of the memory power position. And this is, this is what happens in simple simulations. So I'm not sure how well you can see this, but this, uh, Francesca called it like uh, three different stages in the dynamical evolution of activity in, uh, in the network, where here is, is a kind of overlap or match with the with the pattern of activity in each of, on each position in this 200 meter uh, tunnel. And the activity starts uh, close to when it's very light uh, gray that when you don't see, then it becomes a bit darker and then it, it becomes black. So what you can see is that from uh, light gray to dark gray to black, the, <coughs> the width of the localization uh, increases a little bit, here it's a blow up, and, uh, <coughs> and it moves a little bit, but uh, essentially you have a, a, a good approximation to a continuous attractor. This, however, is not happening always. There is a, a region in the parameter space where you don't have an asymptotic state that is localized. So here, in, in, in simulations in this region of parameter space, you start from something that is very localized, and then in the dark gray activity rises up. Uh, so as to have a, an overlap that is high everywhere in the tunnel, a bit higher in the center, but uh, also at the center, eventually it drops to the same level. So it's like when you make a, a, a fried egg, that it splashes all over. Okay? And uh, we can measure the, the width of this bump, and this width very uh, quickly uh, rises to be uh, uh, or the one that is the whole length of the tunnel. The activity is spread everywhere, it's not localized. The asymptotic states are not localized. And there is another region of the uh, parameter uh, space where something maybe more interesting happens. In this region, activity starts in the light gray. It goes, uh, the, 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 uh, the overlap with each different uh, stored position goes down, spreads. There is a moment where it seems, seem, seems to uh, completely delocalize, but then it emerges again, but in a, in a different random position on, on the time. Yes? So, what, what is plotted here is the overlap between the activity in the network and this uh, stored uh, patterns of activity, eta of uh, i and s. So, it's the, it's the dot product in uh, sum over i of eta by s, that is the stored pattern, and the current activity, you can call it d of i, and is a function of s. No, when you're saying you're looking at different parameter regime. Yeah, parameter regime, I will tell you in a moment what you mean. So there are these three behaviors. So you see here, the activity remains localized, but it's localized in a different position. It's like the bump of activity goes out of the manifold and reappears somewhere else. The manifold extension does not exist as a as a nice uh, linear manifold. And uh, if you do a lot of simulations here, Francesca plots uh, two different indicators that uh, doesn't matter what they are. The, this is the width of the map, and this is the proportion of positions in which you have, uh, uh, you have uh, disappearance of, uh, of the manifold. But what you can see is that clearly there are these three regions, the region of the continuous quasi attractor, the region which is 
There's a, only this is the, the mean number of fields per cell. I mean, this simulation is strictly one, so each cell is only one field. When you have more than one field per cell, you have this region which is delimited by this apparently circular boundary where the network activity is not localized. And there is this uh, region where there is no manifold because the manifold breaks, and this is delimited by this uh, uh, apparently a vertical line. And uh, we were able, I don't want to uh, kind of uh, really go into details of this because we are also not, uh, not sure why, but we were able to compute a signal and the noise analytically with some, uh, with some formula that turn out when they are they are forced to be equal, so the signal to noise ratio is forced to be one. It turns out to be to kind of describe very well this uh, uh, white circular line, which is the boundary between the non localized and the localized uh, region. Why this analytical uh, uh, kind of uh, derivation works, we are not completely sure, but. Uh, but it, it does seem to work. And likewise, we, we found another uh, signal and noise defined in a different way that when uh, that did, uh, a prediction for the boundary between the non-manifold and the con uh, continuous quasi-attractor that is uh, coincides with what we see in, uh, in the simulations. So, this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, tells us that establishing uh, a, an attractor with this, uh, that represents uh, the tunnel is something that, uh, uh, that can be, um, can result from the standard ingredients that we think of uh, are operating uh, in uh, the CAP network like in other networks in other auto specific networks of the day, but within uh, a certain region of parameter space. Where, what are these parameters? These parameters are those in this kind of phase diagrams here. They are the, the essentially the number of fields per cells. And this sigma p and sigma d are the variances in the log normal distribution of the p rate and the diameter of the field. So essentially the amount of disorder in terms of peak rate and in terms of, of diameter of the fields in a log distribution, because everything here has to be thought in log terms, it's a kind of standard uh, Weber law type, type of thing. So they are the ones that determine whether the network can operate as a, as a um, um, spatial memory or not. Interesting, the experimental data, it would be this green dot here, that is semi-heated, is very close to the boundary between uh, when, the attract, when the network can, uh, can work as a memory and when the manifold <coughs> breaks down. We don't know yet what to make of it. Maybe it's because the data we get is from C1, not from C3. We, we should see how it moves. But it's possible that this, uh, this line which does not depend on the variability of the peak rate, but only on the variability of the, of the diameter of the fields, represents some kind of absolute uh, uh, limit on the capability to encode uh, very large environments. I don't want to make a big statement about this because I'm not sure yet. Okay. But, uh, uh, assuming that that we we kind of understand a bit how these uh, uh, manifolds in neural activity could be created with standard ingredients, then the temptation is to go beyond bats flying and uh, apply it to more general uh, creation of unidimensional manifolds. I mentioned space of neural Yes. Question about yeah. So, 
benefits to having multi modal simplex be if I have just one peak per neuron, as long as it's not what to buy. Yeah, yes, what is the benefit of, of uh, multimodal? Yes, if, again, it's a, in, a, in a kind of uh, uh, non explicit way, but it's a limit on the size of the environment uh, that, uh, that you can encode. Uh, so you with smoother, if, if, if you spread the cost of the smoother. Yeah. The statement we made precise as we come together with the statement about the width and so on. But we can uh, intuitively imagine that if I force each cell to have only one field, I cannot uh, import more than anything. So, also in the original experiment, the first step was one big motivation was to understand how parts are able to remember things at such large distances. And it seemed obvious that uh, cells in the hippocampus should have. Uh, multiple, multiple fields. So, going from bats to humans, this is, uh, you know, the comment on, on a very cognitive uh, paper that uh, completely in the behavior of brain sciences. I, I just want to take uh, this picture, which is their, their figure that we modified, just because we put all this uh, little uh, unidimensional manifold reflecting the hypothesis that, uh, that uh, somewhere in our, in our mind we have these uh, uh, structures that uh, correspond to what they call narratives or narrative uh, schemata as a, as a um, um, paths along which our uh, thoughts can flow akin to uh, paths along which uh, a bat can fly and know where it is. So the question is uh, whether this, uh, this uh, uh, unidimensional manifold would have uh, to be in the in the hippocampus. And uh, on this question, there is the very nice work of my friend and colleague uh, Elisa Ciaramelli, who has uh, uh, done a number of interesting studies of mind wandering. That's a moment in a, in a nutshell. So she has this task, very, very simple, in which subjects are asked to do something boring, repetitive, and then they are interrupted at random moments and asked, are you thinking about what you have to do? And if the subject says no, then there are more questions. What are you thinking about? Is it related to you? Is it something in the past? Is it a plan for the future? Whatever. Through this uh, very seemingly uh, uh, homemade uh, kind of scientific study, it's amazing how one can get a very, uh, very uh, good intuition about uh, uh, what may uh, occur in normal subject, but more clearly, what goes wrong in uh, uh, patients with brain lesions. So the hippocampus, we were saying, hippocampus here. If the hippocampus is not working properly, so in patients with hippocampal lesions, what uh, um, uh, ELISA finds is something represented in this figure, which is bad to make, I read it, but it represents uh, beautiful results described uh, in good papers by ELISA. That your flow of thoughts remains with a structure, with this, uh, this kind of uh, skeleton that you see like in normal subjects, but it has lost in hippocampal lesion patients the pictures that pop up that uh, give uh, sensory qualities to your flow of thoughts in mind wandering. So the mind wandering retains its logic, but it loses the richness of content and detail that uh, the colleagues come to the conclusion comes from uh, the hippocampus reactivating 
But uh, normally we call uh, zombies because the graphical memories, but they can also they can also be uh, remeshes of uh, previous experiences that are in the form of imagination about uh, about the future events, uh, not necessarily memories in the strict sense. So these uh, flashes are got to be contributed by the hippocampus. So it's not quite what we were looking after thinking about unidimensional manifolds. Instead, if you look uh, at what the contribution of uh, prefrontal cortex may be, and here these are looked particularly at the certain region of the intermediate prefrontal cortex in a number of patients in which, uh, which who have lesions uh, in, this, uh, in this part of the brain. What you see is that uh, the mind wandering, what these uh, patients describe as what they're thinking about when you interrupt them, retains the sensory qualities, the detailed content, but they come to be more disconnected. It's also more difficult to elicit uh, mind wandering. The task has to be really important. Maybe it's a subject mind wandering. And then the, the images like pop up uncontrolled uh, uh, manner that is uh, uh, more unrelated to, to any, any visible logic. So one can ask uh, if, if we interpret this as, as the, the flow plots losing its, uh, its unidimensional manifolds, its schemata, those uh, paths that uh, force our thoughts to to flow along some logic, what is it that enables prefrontal cortex uh, to extract from your previous experience this schemata, to encode this schemata in its uh, neural representation in prefrontal cortex? And this is uh, what we, we started to ask with Juan uh, uh, and. Uh, there is this uh, basic fact that uh, an atomist uh, was underscored uh, when I was a student here, Valentino Bryden there was, and also Moshe were the ones emphasizing it a lot, that the basic structure of the cortex is always the same. But the fact that the basic, the basic circuitry of the cortex is always the same still is compatible with several parameters and kind of quantitative variations, and uh, one uh, parameter, an anatomical parameter that has uh, important quantitative variations is that uh, local uh, prefrontal networks have much denser recurrent connections. This has been uh, uh, quantified in particular by neuroanatomists, very important work that I think is not uh, widely appreciated, Gary Elston where this comparative work in primates and in many species comparing the number of spines on basal dendrites, those that carry uh, most of the recurrent inputs to pyramidal cells, in occipital cortex in human macaque and, and marmoset cells, you have something between, say, 1 and 2,000 is an estimate of the number of spines per cell. Whereas in temporal and even more in front of cortex, we have almost 10 times as much across uh, species. So you could say that uh, even though the structure of the cortex uh, is, uh, is basically always the same, the frontal cortex is uh, much more uh, recurrent. And uh, with Paul Gill, so we, we combine this idea of a uh, of a gradient with the uh, other idea that uh, also was uh, inspired many, many years ago by Valentino Breitner uh, and his, uh, his uh, forceful anatomical argument that uh, you can think of the cortex largely as a machine that talks, that, was Breitner, that talks with itself, in which uh, you can think of the cortical surfaces as partitioned in patches that do not really exist, but the idea is that each patch 
is a densely recurrent network that is uh, sparsely connected with all other patches so that the influence of, on, on pyramidal cells is about of the same order of magnitude, the influence from local connections and from uh, long range connections. We have, in, in the course of uh, many years, we have uh, studied this Breitenberg model in, uh, with the POTS network. The POTS network is a is a neural network in which units are not representing uh, neurons, but small patches of cortex. And uh, each unit has a number of states, which can be, say, three, seven, any number, which represent local attractor states of the patch. It's a very abstract model because the patches are not uh, really delimited in the cortex. They do not exist, as Valentino Greider was, was, was the first to, to admit. But it can serve as a, a mathematically tractable uh, model of this cortical uh, 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 machinery in which there are local interactions and long range interactions. The local interactions are subsumed in the dynamics of these POTS units. And then uh, uh, coupling it together with the idea of this capital axis from uh, back front of the brain amounts to thinking about uh, POTS networks that have uh, uh, a mixture of uh, POTS units with uh, a low number of states and POTS units with a high number of states and that interact with each other. So in this sense now we're talking about a mixed population, a population of units that are all POTS units, very simple, abstract, mathematically manageable, but in which there is one parameter that varies the number of states per unit, and the simple situation in which we take half of the network, like right? yes, half of the network with units that have few states, and half of the network with units that have more states, to re reflect the fact that the current processing at the local level is not to be more important in the frontal part of the cortex. So from a lot of uh, complex evidence, we make a very simple model, which we think is interesting, because <coughs> it, uh, it kind of uh, uh, hit, hits the, the fact that a long time ago, physicists studied a disordered system of uh, POTS units, what they call the POTS spin glass, found interesting properties that depend on the number of states. In particular, this is uh, really statistical physics of a very, of a very uh, mathematical model that may have no... Uh, yes? What is the Hamiltonian of this system? What is it? The Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian. There are, in fact, uh, uh, two different systems with, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you as a, as a kind of uh, <laughs> private thing because I don't have time to explain, but, but uh, there are two different systems that are both, you can call, uh, epochs in glass. The one... Uh, no, no, I mean the interaction. The, 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 the interaction. Exactly, the interaction. The, the, one, the one considered the by Eld, uh, Elderfield and, and Sheraton. Uh, let me let me put up this. Okay, so is you have the interactions are like this. Okay, yeah. but in the one originally considered by uh, uh, Elderfin and Sheraton, so you have two pot units, each of which has uh, a certain number of states, but the same or different, and then you can think of an interaction term that is specific to a pair of states and a pair of units. And another version is to think of an interaction term that has a certain value for the two units, but is the same across all combination of states. That is the version considered initially by Elderfin and Shelton, which is not this formula here. It turns out that for one of these surprising things of statistical physics, the two models, although conceptually quite different, can be analyzed uh, with the very similar mathematics and certain things come out uh, 
come out very, very similar. So in both cases, you have different uh, uh, thermodynamic regimes, which uh, I, I don't really want to get into this. If this is the, the kind of Parisi function, Parisi no, recent Nobel Prize in physics. It has different shapes depending on whether the number of states is very low between 2 and 2.882. Don't ask me what, how it's possible to think of a number of states that uh, is not an integral, but mathematically is perfectly legitimate. Another region is between uh, 2.82 and 4, and then bigger than 4. It's, it's a different physics, whatever that means, in the, in the asymptotic states. For this system which is disordered and in which each unit has uh, multiple states. And now one can ask whether this is relevant also for the case where the, the interactions are not pure disordered but reflect some memory like we would like them to in the cortex. First, we can ask whether this different thermodynamics. So in different thermodynamics means that it's a difference in, in the kind of asymptotic states of a network of this type, whether it's relevant also for the dynamics, which is something we would like to understand more when we think about the cortex and the brain. We don't care what will happen if you take a network isolated and let it run for 200 years. But it, we think of cognitive uh, scales. So we are interested in dynamics. Can I think of the x-axis in terms of In, in these plots, so this is a, a plot of uh, q of x uh, is the distribution of value of this uh, 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 Parisi function. This is it's, uh, it's, uh, the probability of the different values. And this is how it, it would vary with this mysterious uh, parameter x. It's essentially a measure of the similarity between uh, uh, different uh, configurations that have the same happenings uh, uh, and that evolve independently. And uh, it's, it's a very... So it's a distribution. It's a distribution. It's a very uh, uh, difficult object to intuit. That's why uh, Parisi deservedly got the Nobel Prize. It was very difficult to come up with this description, but it's one of the beautiful things of uh, statistical physics. Now, dynamics. These disordered systems of this type, they are classy. What, what does it mean? If you look, for example, at how the energy varies in time, here the time is on a log scale, Typically, the system relaxes very rapidly, and then it, uh, it has a uh, very slow dynamics in which it sits at a metastable state until it finds a, a state with a bit lower energy, and it has this transition that can come after a very long time. So it's, uh, it's glassy, slow dynamics. Now, when, when we want to, to try to, to quantify it in, in simulations for our model, so we adopt this paradigm we take an initial configuration and we let it uh, evolve so with two different evolutions with a kind of uh, uh, different uh, independently uh, the, the uh, small randomness of the evolution which can be the order in which you have the limits and we measure how long it takes until the two uh, different configurations that evolve from the same starting point have reached, say, half of their initial uh, similarity, which was one. And then <coughs> this can happen at different times. So tau is the time at which the evolution of two configurations has, has reached uh, its value of one half. And then we plot the distribution of uh, value tau, and it has this typical log uh, normal shape, which is, which is everywhere, it's not that interesting to us. What we want to, to see is what is the typical speed, and how does it depend on the number of states per unit, because that was our initial goal, we wanted to model the cortex 
with a frontal part that has more states per unit and a posterior part that has fewer states in each of its spots. So that was our goal. We went through a long detour to physics, but we want to go back, back to it. So this is the basic uh, finding when you have an isolated network, either with few states per unit or with many states per unit, but all the units have the same number of states. So if there are like two states per each unit, the network is very fast, it evolves very fast, so here it's uh, the log of tau. So it's a measure of like uh, <coughs> one means uh, time, uh, uh, everything happens <coughs> around tau equal 10. Three means around ta tau equal 1000 time steps or whatever that is. So if, uh, if this is a cumulative distribution, if uh, the units have uh, two states, the network evolves very fast. If the units have uh, uh, seven states, it's much, much slower. Now I take, instead of a homogeneous network, I take what we call a hybrid network. That is, I combine half the network with few states and half the network with uh, uh, more states per unit. And we see this. Uh, uh, this thing that I think is a genuine discovery of Quang Yi, that there is an inversion. That is, on average, the units that were slower when they were on their own become faster, and they become faster than the units that were fast and that have now become slower. So the black, the units with few state become slower than the units with uh, uh, seven states. So it's not simply that the, the hybrid network uh, interpolates, it produces this kind of speed inversion, which uh, is something that may be completely irrelevant to anything, but I was very excited because I think it's a, it's a genuine discovery. I have not seen it uh, uh, described. I don't know if other people have uh, uh, looked at this uh, hybrid uh, POTS network. It is a robust effect. So the degree here is the speed of units with two states. And uh, how much they have slowed down by being in the network with units with three, four, seven, or 15 states. So the more states they have to cohabit with, something that could have sociological implications that they don't want to get into the more the units that are initially very fast get slowed down. And uh, <coughs> there is this speed inversion. Here it's not very prominent, but say the units with two states get a lot slowed down by the interaction, and the units with 15 states get faster to the point that they are faster than the units with the two states. They start from being much, much slower, and they get faster. So it's a, it's a uh, phenomenon that is there uh, uh, for different number of states. And we, <coughs> we try to make it uh, uh, more relevant to the brain by first uh, introducing asymmetric connections. So uh, when you don't have a Hamiltonian description and energy, and you still have the speed inversion effect, and then thinking of a network when there is a zero state that we need to model the cortex. I don't want to get into that. And uh, also thinking of having a network that is not purely random, as in the initial study, but has uh, auto-associative connection. Still, you find that the, the units with many states are uh, faster than the units with, uh, um, um, with few states. So, we are in the middle of our study, but at the end of my talk, because this is more or less the point where we got. What we would like to understand is whether this uh, uh, speed inversion effect plays a role in uh, making prefrontal cortex 
particularly apt at extracting uh, this uh, manifold, attractive manifold out of experience where subjects are exposed to repeating uh, patterns, schemata that they want, they, they can encode in their memories. So we are trying to, to kind of, with the help of ELISA, to build some model of that where it's not just uh, uh, constructing uh, uh, memory representation but also paths for uh, mind wandering and, and thinking about the future. So the idea again would be that the contribution of the hippocampus is to provide these snapshots, this kind of uh, um, flooding with content that comes from memories that are essentially snapshots, so things that occur together, whereas the contribution of the prefrontal cortex in general, or at least the part that, uh, the intermediate part that, uh, from which we have uh, a user's data, is to provide this schema that is this skeleton on which the snapshots uh, can be appended like a decoration on a Christmas tree. We are trying to, uh, to look at that with this uh, model in which uh, here would be the, the activity in this uh, latching mode that we've done in many years, in which uh, the activity of the frontal cortex jumps from pattern to pattern in a sequence that the frontal cortex expresses spontaneously but that reflects its uh, previous experiences and it drives a corresponding sequence in the posterior cortex. So this is continuous behavior in the frontal cortex and this is, uh, is the uh, corresponding sequence elicited in the posterior cortex driven by the frontal cortex. So that's the model we are following, but we do not know yet what will happen. And thank you very much for the other. <coughs> yes. Uh, it's a very famous question. Uh, you showed the difference between these two pods, and uh, changes the times. Is that a difference in the equilibrium? So, <coughs> yes, so bo both, both parts, when they are uh, isolated, have this uh, spin glass phase, which is a description of this disordered uh, equilibrium state, which is uh, intrinsically disordered. And uh, we uh, write the model so that uh, the transition temperature uh, from the, uh, the paramagnetic state to the spin glass state is the same. Otherwise, we would be kind of cheating because, yeah. So they both, when they, the two methods are isolated, they both enter the spin glass phase at the same temperature, whatever temperature means that in particular phase. And then when we combine, that temperature is also the transition temperature for the hybrid network. So the hybrid network has a disordered phase in which its dynamics is, in broad terms, slower than if it were a well-engineered system, like instead of the normal foster thinking, a complete message move around. But still, we can measure separately the speed of the two halves of the but it's this in the same equilibrium phase. Question on the uh, quasi continuous tractor from the first part. Is it, do you think about it as a continuous tractor or as a sequence of discrete tractors? No, it's not. You, you can think it either way because I think uh, the discretization would be a mental operation that we apply to the kind of uh, what comes out of the simulation. But uh, you can think it either way. But for me, it's more intuitive to think of a, of a manifold 
that is continuous, like a river in which there are, on the bed of the river, there are these homogeneities, holes and uh, little mounds, so the water uh, can flow, but if, if there is little water, it will form little ponds that appear as, uh, as the kind of really equilibrium point. But normally, there is dynamics, there is external inputs, it means a lot of water, it will just uh, flow without being too sensitive to this uh, discretization. Yes? It's not clear to me, what, what, how, is, how is the, the network is big when perhaps this one down the uh, kill? S sorry? How do you build the network? What is the connectivity? In the POTS network? In the, in the POTS network with, uh, with uh, several uh, number of states. states. So, so, uh, when the network uh, is, 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 is homogeneous, every unit has the same number of states, you have the possibility of building what was this Enterfield Sherrington version, which is you give a price in energy terms to two units pointing in the same direction, and you give the opposite amount, so that on average uh, zero, whatever, to all other possibilities. So there is a meaning to having two units pointing in the same direction. Uh, this is an interesting so model. This is it's, the, it's, it's the Enterfield Sherrington model. This is not the post class of uh, studied by. Uh, also by uh, other people, also. High and high. High. Yes. Lots of interest. Not, not so many, lots is the wrong one. There are interesting works from now in the in the large few limit, this is the most limit. There is, there is also. There is a spin glass or there is no spin glass first? There is a spin glass, but in fact, first, has, first has been scored. When, when the number of states is uh, larger than four, the transition to the spin glass is discontinuous. That was the key result of the 80s. But the, the, uh, the one step in particular symmetry breaking is exact. You can do the full graphic asymmetry breaking, and and the transition is at four dimensions. If you do the one step, you find it at six dimensions. Yes, okay. yeah. one step. Is yeah. But since first we wanted to model the cortex, in the cortex there is no meaning to having two local patches being in the same direction, the same attractor. Of course, every patch is caring about different content. So we wanted to get rid of this, of this kind of uh, absolute directions in the tractors. And we wanted to implement what you could call in particle physics gauge invariance. That is, every direction is in the same relation to the directions of the other patches. On top of that, we wanted to look at hybrid networks in which the number of states is different in two different patches. So there, is, there cannot be any meaning in the correspondence. So we looked at this, uh, at this version that was, uh, that was here. In which uh, each interaction between units i and j in states k and l is a random number with a certain distribution. Independent of the interaction uh, between the same two units, but another k and l prime. So everything is as disordered it can be. Interestingly, this has many more parameters because there is one interaction term for each pair of states. The thermodynamics is a bit simpler because you, you don't have to have this constraint that of this interaction at the same, but it's very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.